here, and uh, maybe you could let me know when you first see an image. This is on your YouTube again, right? This is on YouTube, okay. YouTube live events, yeah. Okay, okay, you saw my head briefly? Yeah. I see, okay, and now, okay, now in a, in a moment you should see my screen. Uh, uh, yeah, so you, 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 you now see uh, uh, sort of infinite the recursive Google Hangout. The recursive Google. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well described, Aria. Well described. Okay. Um, and and can you hear my utterances through uh, through the through the web? Yeah. It would appear so. Uh, okay. Um, uh, great. So, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for bearing with the situation yesterday and for bearing with uh, the uh, room issues today. Um, so today we're going to be continuing on a, an important topic that we started talking about last time, and that has to do with um, a, a key element of many functional programming languages, which is um, the presence of mechanisms um, to uh, put in place uh, non-strict computations, um, a subset of which are, are further called uh, lazy, lazy computations. Um, does anyone remember uh, from the book reading what it to, if if we say a, a a computation or um, a method to make it uh, more concrete for this example is non-strict? Um, what what does that mean? Or if we say it's strict, what does that mean? Equally much so. Morning. Well, strict method will evaluate the arguments inside the method, but a non-strict one won't necessarily, won't necessarily do that. Okay, I, I think that's a fair uh, description of it. Uh, thanks, Dory. Um, so, uh, for something that's strict, of necessity, if you um, pass it, say, as an argument for, for a case of a method, a, um, a computation which does not terminate, calling that method on that computation will also not terminate. It, it, it of necessity will not terminate. By contrast, something that's non-strict has the option of, of uh, terminating, uh, even if the thing passed to it um, would not itself terminate. Um, and the fact is that if we look beyond methods, um, any of us uh, in the room um, and anyone out there listening who has worked with common programming languages um, could reflect on the fact we deal with non-strictness at a, a, a certain level on a very familiar basis. It's just we don't we don't even know notice particularly how remarkable it is or how significant it is. And a classic example of this is an if statement. So if you have an if statement, if such and such do such and such, um, you could think of that construct as kind of taking as arguments of sorts, or parameterized to it. Two things. One is the condition to check. The second thing is what to do if that condition is true, right? And um, it, we might routinely pass an if statement where the you know the condition say is false, um, and what it does if it's if it were true would be to loop forever, and that that if statement will still terminate, right? It it it'll say. Is this thing passed to be true? No, it's false. And so it'll not even execute the, the thing to do if it were true. And that's an example of non-strictness because we can, we have this construct, we parameterize it, we, we specify it to, to operate with something that could, could loop forever, but um, it, it, it doesn't have to execute that thing, right? By contrast, methods and, and, and languages that you prob folks probably learned um, in your um, undergraduates um, are routinely strict. Um, not all of them. Haskell is another example that's non-strict, uh, but uh, many languages are strict. And functional programming has long put an emphasis on non-strictness as a powerful tool. And one of the reasons for that, as we'll see, is that it's a powerful tool for language extension for, for adding constructs to languages. 
So in a language like Java or a language like C, for example, we have certain privileged constructs that are keywords, right? If, while, for, and it's variants and, and, and various types of statements and so on. And those are kind of baked into language and they exist at kind of a privileged level, a, a different plane than the code we write. We make use of them, but we can't alter the language and say, you know, we want to add to, to Java a to until construct or uh, what have you. We don't have that that option. Um, so, so with not and one of the reasons is because everything is strict. We we can't we can't create new constructs that are non-strict. But in Scala, um, as in Haskell, as in many other functional programming languages, there are mechanisms for doing that. And in fact, if you look back to the Lisp experience, I think. Um, probably back to the 1960s, otherwise uh, almost certainly the 70s, the era of Lisp machines and symbolics and so on, um, and going through the early 80s, um, these, um, or mid 80s, these uh, methods were uh, really explored of non-strictness. And there was a construct in Lisp called a macro, which um, unfortunately goes by the same name as C, C macros, but it's far more powerful. and. Um, and, and that's one of the mechanisms for language extension. So, um, you know, something we talked about last time was, uh, was this issue of, of laziness, and we, and we examined it particularly through streams and its implications for incremental processing. Um, the fact that rather we can have pipelines, and rather than mapping a whole collection, at, you know, one element of the pipeline executes, you get a whole collection out. Another aspect of the pipeline executes, you get another whole collection out. Say, you know, you apply a, you apply for the first one a map, and you get a collection out. And the second one, you apply a filter, you get a collection out. The third one, you apply a reduce, you know, you get out a value. Here, we're we're actually processing each element one by one, one by one, as needed to drive the pipeline and. And I noted that has huge implications for reducing memory demand. Um, turns out non-structures also facilitates uh, reuse of mechanisms. Um, and um, Scala, reflecting the general value of non-strictness and its kind of lazy um, laziness is kind of its way of capturing uh, non-strictness, is uh, it provides several different mechanisms. Um, some of them we've seen informally. Some we've seen a little bit more formally. So last time we talked more about streams. We're gonna be doing more streams. Uh, there's also a thing called lazy values, which are call by need. Uh, there's uh, there's also uh, call by name parameters, um, which uh, which provide a way of, of, of allowing things in non-strictness. And in fact, we, um, we could take whole collections and say essentially treat them as non-strict uh, non in certain ways, uh, which is uh, useful. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to call up our uh, Scala uh, interpreters here in whatever form you're going to execute them. I have my Scala um, interpreter over here, and I, I guess I'll make use of that. And um, we're going to pursue today a number of um, a number of, of little examples. And why don't we start with something from um, from last time at a level, but we'll we'll be operating off this example through the um, through the balance of the the lecture. Okay, so I'd like you to import Scala.math, import Scala.math.underbar. So this imports uh, everything uh, within uh, Scala.math, um, and I'd like to create a um, uh, a stream. And we're going to start with a particularly simple and familiar stream, uh, the stream of po positive integers. And I'm going to be showing a construct here, which is um, uh, which is going to be called iterate. And iterate, iterate's job in life is to produce, uh, in this case, a stream, otherwise a collection of of things, a sort of linear collection where each element is a function applied to the last element, okay? The first is x. The second, so that's uh, that's x here. Second is f of x. That will be the whatever function applied to that. 
Third is f of f of x. Fourth is f of f of f of x. Um, here, f is at 1. Okay. And as you might expect, that will yield a somewhat familiar um, set of quantities. Um, should not iterate, iterate 0L, that's a, a zero along. And here we're going to have something that takes in uh, along. And I say I, oh, oh no, no, I don't want to display 523. Display I long. And its job in life is to return I plus 1. Okay. Okay. And what do you think the second L? Oops. Positive. No. Positive. What do you think the elements are going to be? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Two, two, one, two. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's positive integers. That, that's good. That's good. The, the name. <laughs> the name is intention revealing by design. Okay. So uh, positive ints dot ache. I'll take the first ten. And we will go and display them, and there they are, right? Now, if we go to look at it, by the way, we say just positive ints. Um, look what it's going to show us, because it's computed all the way out to here. Do you see that? And a very important point here, important for memory issues, is these are memoized. These it remembers. It computed them by need, and it remembered them thereafter, OK? Okay, um, so this is all well and good. Let's now um, go and we're going to define a function whose job is to determine if things are, uh, are uh, squares. So if given a long, it's going to determine if that long is a perfect square. Okay, when I say perfect squares, I mean things like 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, etc. Right? Okay, so uh, it's important that this operate on uh, longs. Um, and uh, so I'll say is square. And we'll take in a value that's a long. What did I call it here? I called it n, um, which is a long. And because it's a function and not merely a method, I have to say this equal sign. It returns a value, in other words. doesn't just do something. And what we're going to do is there's a little bit of kind of finesse here. But we're going to test if, um, if we take its square root and we get the nearest long just less than that or equal to it or critically equal to it, um, um, is it, uh, do we have a situation where um, it's simply the square of that, okay? So, so what we will do is we'll say val root equals, and we're going to use uh, several things here. One is going to be round. I believe that goes from doubles to, to longs. The other thing is floor. And then the final thing is square root of, of n. And now we've got to count our, our parentheses, OK? Um, don't need parentheses while you can. Um, OK, here we go. And then we're going to, to test if that thing is uh, equal to n, OK? So let's, let's check it out, right? Is square 2? False. Is square 4? Happy, uh, 16, happy, 17, false, uh, 15, okay. okay. Um, but we could test it uh, better than that. Um, okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the stream we created, positive ends, and we will create uh, a new string, val, um, uh, val uh, uh, perfect squares, right? Um, and how would we get the set of perfect squares out of the stream we already have? Yeah, good. Okay, all right, all right. we all have to say positive. Now you could argue it's, on, it's positive longs and, and it's ints in, in a conceptual sense, okay? Dot filter. What? 
a square of, of, of that thing, right? Okay, happy, happy. Okay. Okay, here's our perfect squares. Perfect uh, squares um, dot take five, first five perfect squares, mm -hmm. take 50, first 50 per perfect squares, right? Um, however we want, many we want, it could give it to us. Now, if we were to go look at the perfect square stream, it will still have only evaluated the first so many elements of the, oh, sorry, the, per, the positive events, and will only have evaluated the first so many elements of positive events, because it didn't have to scan forward, uh, you know, for hundreds of thousands to find these squares. It did, it evaluated however many it needed to deliver on this request, right? It's a very, um, you know, very important point. Now, along those lines, I'd like to talk with you about something that the book uh, spoke about, which is a very powerful mechanism when dealing with streams. We said last time that streams kind of pack up a computation. At some level, uh, they're distinguished in, in several regards. Um, one way you you know that's fruitful to think about them is separating the specification of a computation from its actual computation. And yeah, that's kind of uh, kind of interesting. So the computation may be infinitely long, but that's distinct from the issue of how far have you actually evaluated it, which is very flexible. But I think uh, there's other other situations where well, we'll see that as well. Um, I think a more interesting point of view uh, is actually to emphasize that they also provide us a way of kind of creating a construct which knows how to do its job. It wraps up everything it needs to do to produce a computation for us. It remembers the recipe by which it needs to make more, you know, to deliver more of uh, the computation. And on an on-demand basis, it will deliver that. Okay, it will deliver that. And we see that here. You know, there's this positive ends but it's not gonna do that computation anymore that's needed for us to, to compute this. And there's a mechanism that the book introduced called co-recursion of producing streams. Producing streams in a, not surprisingly, recursive way. Um, and this involves sort of an interaction between a stream on the one hand and a function on the other, which produces that stream. And where the function critically, Maintain state, maintain state in its in the calls to it. So what we're going to put into place here is an old favorite. It's an old favorite of the mathematical world, but it's an old favorite of the natural world as well, because it's linked to so many interesting natural phenomena, including things in the botany uh, realm uh, and uh, things related to human uh, endeavors like, like uh, architecture. So Fibonacci, who remembers what the Fibonacci sequences are? Anyone? Yeah, good. So, so what is it that distinguishes a Fibonacci sequence? So, so we could list them, one, one, two, three, five, but, but what's the recipe? Numbers. Yeah, the sum of the previous two. Okay, so let's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's create a function to generate uh, a Fibonacci stream. Okay, here we go. Um, this is going to take in uh, two arguments, A and B, and this is going to return a stream of longs, okay? and reflect the effect, it's a function, we're gonna do this. So we want this to return Fibonacci numbers. Now I'm gonna tell you, A and B are kind of the state that it's building up to, it knows where it is in the computation sequence. Um, and I'll give you a hint here um, that the first thing we're going to add is we're going to conclude A. 
what is this? Uh, sorry, um, what is this? Uh, this construct here. Does anyone remember? This is where I have to give a pause. <laughs> what is this thing that I've highlighted here? A pen. A pen for what? For streams. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So well. Yeah. So this is say basically stream from this equals a and then an append in a stream context it's stuck at the beginning of a stream um and what's the next thing that needs to occur here i'll give you a hint it involves recursion so a is the first element i'll give you a hint b is going to be the second element of the stream returned by this Yes, yes, yes. There we go. Let's figure out how that works. So, so A and B are going to be in sequence. A is going to come first. When we call Fibonacci a B, B is going to come next. And then what's going to come next? A plus B, right? And then it's going to work forward from there, right? Okay, so let's 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 try that. Each one is always going to be the sum. Of, you know, we're going to get a and b, and then the sum of the two, right? This is a co-recursive procedure. It's co-recursive with it's it's producing the stream and it's calling back in itself to get you know further streams along the way, appending. So what is this thing going to return? Well, what do all calls to Fibonacci return? A what? A stream, right? So this is going to be basically returning a stream where A is had, and then, then it's the stream caused by this, which we know is going to be first B, and then A plus B, and then you know it's going to be successively um, uh, other elements, right? So it's going to be A plus uh, plus uh, 2B, I, I believe, would be the next. In any case, it's it just follows mathematically. So, so here, we're going to say val fibs. Here are the, the fibs. Fibonacci. Um, and what are the first two uh, elements of the Fibonacci? Yeah, we could do one, one, two. I mean, people could sometimes also put zero in there, but yeah, we'll, we'll do one, one. Okay. Um, here we go. And. Um, and we are going to put in place um, now uh, a quick look at, at this. So we'll take the first 10 Fibonacci's, right? Here we go. Fibonacci's uh, force. Boom. There they are. OK. Um, that's great. Uh, we can. Of course, now if we just said fibs, we'd see the first ten computed, and then, then it's it's waiting for the others. Okay, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, now what we could do is, how if we wanted to find Fibonacci's numbers that are perfect squares? How would we do that? How did we do it earlier? Yeah. Sorry. Filter, filter. Okay, so here we'll say val square fibs, right? Equals fibs dot filter. And what do we, how do we have to filter? Remember, filter takes a function. So yeah, is square of this guy, right? Whatever the argument is. Yeah. We could specify out the argument, you know, x maps to x square, uh, is square of x. But. Okay, so now let's go look at the square fibs, right? Um, square fibs, be careful here. Be careful. <laughs> Trust me, be careful. I'm going to take the first two. Don't, don't do this at home, okay? Um, uh, yeah. Maybe they're computing for a while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, First uh, three that are perfect squares, 144. I do not do four, <laughs> okay? 
<laughs> unless you have a whip fast computer. Um, and even that, I can't promise convergence. Okay, poor poor Dorian has been uh, stuck now. Okay, um, okay. Suppose we want to have fibs that are. So these are the first first three square fibs. How if we want to have all? How if we want to have fibs between um, uh, ten thousand and eleven thousand? How do we do that? Sorry. Yeah, we could do it with filter, sure. So square fibs dot square fibs dot filter. And here we'll actually take the argument explicitly and we'll say, okay, um uh that n is greater than or equal to ten thousand uh, and n is less than uh eleven thousand. Okay, I'm not I'm 11,000 is exclusive. Oh, 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 um, I should have done a, a take uh, on that, right? Um, so now it's it's computing the, the fibs here, and we should uh, we should have a uh, result soon enough, but um, I should have been more careful in computing it. So here, the filtering is going to go on until it has found these, right? Except, ooh, I've got to be careful here. It's try what is it trying to do right now? It's working. You can hear it from across the table. Oh, look at that, look at that. Oh man, a stack, okay, okay, uh, mumble. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, okay, uh, so it's still unhappy. Let's, let's go see what's uh, going on here. Chrome, well, that, that, I can't. Can, can you see me? Okay, here we go. Share. Present to everyone. Am I back? Okay, okay. Um, thank you for letting me know this. Root times root equals n. Oops. Uh, import scala.math. Boom. Okay, boom. Okay. And uh, and then we uh, we deft uh, Fibonacci um, uh, with this and stream long equals a and then Fibonacci of b comma a plus b. So why did it die? Why did Scala die? Not Google Chrome. It's not a tail recursion. Now, in the book, 
there's actually a comment, and maybe in a footnote, that in general, things that are not tail recursive, a certain important subset of them, you can actually turn into tail recursive things. Um, and it's a clever trick there involving um, essentially adding a parameter which can allow you to sort of make it tail recursive, which can then turn it into an iterative thing when, the, when it's compiled, which can make it much more efficient rather than building up a stack. Um, we won't get into that, but it's it's worth noting that, that that sort of mechanism can allow you to avoid the sort of stack problems associated with uh, recursive recursive calls. Um, so I'll just say, you know, uh, fibs here equals Fibonacci, Fibonacci of one one, and um, and I will further note that um, um, we can um, uh, we can get uh, square fibs uh, val square fibs. Um, well, actually, sorry, um, fibs dot just just to sort of complete the thought. Fibs that are between uh, 100 and um, uh, and uh, so n n greater than or equal to 100 and n less than you know 150 or something like that, right? Um, we actually have to be very careful. I have a theory about what was going on uh, before. Did we do it of square fibs? Yeah. Are you kidding? Are you serious? Oh my man. man. Okay. Well, that was that was my problem because there's there's a very good explanation for what happened there besides the fact that it had a stack overflow. Yes, it had a stack overflow, but there's a reason it had a stack overflow. Um, what what was that reason? Why is it that it, it had that problem? What was it doing? When you compute a stream, does it compute all of the stream? Then what was it what was it spending so much time doing? It needs to find what? The first one. Sorry, the right. first one. Yeah. The first one that matches. Uh, the, the first one that's produced is the first one that matches the what? The condition. Yeah, that achieves the filter. Yeah. And the fact that it just went on and on then suggests that there was no square fib likely between 10,000 and 11,000. Yeah. And as a result, it just went on and on. And, it, and see, this is a key point. It's not smart enough to realize that once it's reached... 11,000, there's never going to be another one which is going to match that condition. So it's going to go to 12,000, 13,000. It may have been up to hundreds of thousands, millions, looking for the fabled fib between 10,000 and 11,000, right? Now, and apparently that's because I said square fibs. There was none. But I will anticipate and you could see that it's correct by the skin of our teeth that there is one in this range. In fact, it's right there. And very likely that's the only one. So I'm not going to say big fibs in range dot take two force because bad things will happen because it will lo go on and on and on and on. Um, in any case, um, here we see that we can on demand you know, request um, additional elements, but also you see this element of co-recursion. So Fibonacci, this call keeps track of its state. Its current state is what are sort of the next two elements in, in it. And based on that, it's producing a stream by calling itself recursively and passing itself the updated state. We will see an example of this very similarly that's very beautiful for differential equations, where you produce the next integral, the, the next little bit of the differential equation solution by passing it the value of the state variables now. It could 
produce. Okay, what where do they go to next? And where do they go to next? And where do they go to next? You can get a stream out of that. Okay. Um, and we won't go into the whole issue of converting these things to tail recursive, but it could be uh, quite enabling here. So streams are powerful, but streams are also things that have to be used with respect um, in terms of they're, they're not, you know, just magical. They allow you to, uh, to um, you know, compute anything um, in a flexible way without wor worrying about, uh, about uh, termination. In fact, there are real termination issues. And a particular thing that you find for a lot of teaching examples is the fact that it doesn't know that this is an ascending sequence is a barrier because it doesn't know to stop looking you know, in many cases. Okay, okay, but let's, uh, our, our focus today is, is not just on uh, streams and co-recursion, it's, it's more general than that. So I'd like to remember back to a few things here. One is, um, do you remember back um, very early in the class, we created, for example, a vector of length 100 with random elements. How did we do that? We used currying. So what did I do here? I want to create a vector of 100 elements of, of um, uh, random values. What would I need to do? Yeah, we, we need to fill. So let's first import scala.util.random, right? Um, uh, here, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll do we'll do the uh, the fill here. Okay, so vector uh, vector dot fill of a hundred, and then we'll say next double. Right? Remember this? And then we got a vector fill. Right? Um, or we could say next string. Right? Next string. Oh, oops. Uh, sorry. Uh, mumble. Uh, next string of. Um, there we are. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we could use a similar construct here with streams by just saying stream dot continually and say next double. Okay. And here, uh, this is going to give us a stream, however long we need to use it, of numbers pseudo randomly distributed between zero and one. Okay. So we could say, you know, take the first 10. Yeah. Oh, uh, did you do the take on the previous example? Oh yeah. I had to actually terminate Zeppelin, like stop the Docker container and then rebuild it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so to be uh, clear here, um, and uh, m maybe um, you could just make sure she, if, if she needs any help now, um, Dorian can, uh, can come over. Yeah, yeah. So basically you did that from the command line? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you terminated. Yes, and then you print the first two characters of the ID. So. The first two characters of, of the ID. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So stream this continually next double. This will actually produce a stream of of numbers, and, and as a stream, it's however long it needs to be, and it it's arbitrarily long here, and it's composed of of random numbers, right? Um, how would I how would I um, find, uh, for example? Um, the first um, the first ten of these that lie between point five and point six. What would I do here? Yeah. Okay. So why don't I give these names right? Val, Rands. Uh, here, these are these these uh, random numbers. If I were to say rands.filter and uh, we will look for something, it's a double value and we will check if it's greater than or equal to 0.5 and D is, is less than 0 0.6, right? 
Hmm. Okay, so that's uh, that's good. Um, let's suppose that we had thing rand ints, and instead of doing next double, suppose we do next int, where we give it a uh, further argument to that indicates the range, basically be between zero and whatever this thing is, a hundred here. Okay, you probably can't see it yet. Zero and a hundred. So rand ints contains random numbers, random integers between 0 and 100, and I'll take the first five, for example, and force them. Okay. How if I wanted to get a sequence? So these numbers, you'll notice, are not guaranteed to be unique. Mm -hmm. They could There could be repetitions in here. There could be things which are repeated more than once, right? Um, they're each drawn independently. Suppose I want to get 10 distinct, a random sample of 10 distinct random numbers. So, so what I have right now is sampling with replacement. Do, does that, is that a meaningful term to you folks? Yeah. You sample from the values between 0 and 100, excluding 100 itself. So 0 and 99 inclusive. You, you're sampling with replacement. You could have more more than one instance of a value, right? Suppose I wanted to get the first, suppose I want to get a sample of 20 numbers sampled without replacement. How would I do that? Randomly distributed, but sampled without replacement. Sorry? Uh may not have may not have heard that properly uh, so so rand ends well it turns out there's a thing called distinct is that what you're or you're, you're trying to say distinct distinct okay so i will tell you that given a stream in calling distinct on it will give you a stream out that will be the same as the stream in, except it will eliminate repeated values. So it sounds like that's what whale had in mind. So how would I find a sample of 20 of them? What would I do? Just take 20 and force. Yeah, take 20 and force. Right? So here's a sample of ints between zero and 100 sampled without replacement, right? There's no one of these that repeats. Previously, if we had taken, um, taken them, we, uh, we would get, uh, get cases where it, was, uh, where it was repeated for sure, right? Um, so if we had taken enough, and perhaps even in the first 20, we might have seen some um, that were uh, repeated more than once, right? Um, how would we have found if something was repeated here? Just going uh, going back uh, to remember our higher, higher, higher order operations, what would we do? What could we do to find out if any of these are repeated? Group by identity. Yeah, group group by, and then you could group by uh, the identity, right? Uh, oops, okay, yeah, humble. Um, okay, so X, and I think it doesn't know the type, so I'll, I'll give it a type, and I'll, I'll just say. So. Uh, and then, uh, then what would I need to do? Dot map values, and map the value onto the size of it, right? Because it's a collection, right? So, uh, so it's a set, and or it's actually a, a stream. Um, uh, and I'll do stream dot size, right? Something like that. Yeah. So here we don't happen to have any uh, any ones, but uh, if if we were to uh, repeat it, we'd probably get uh, 
get a repeated value in here at some point. Yeah. So the point is, this is actually sampling it by replacement. And if you think about what that computation would look like comparatively, how to sample the 20 values with no repeats, it's, it would actually be a lot less pretty. How, how would you do that? Well, you could build up a data structure where you keep track what the values you already have and just scan to make sure the new value isn't part of that. It would, it would get kind of awkward. And uh, you could have a, a set and you know add them into the set until the set meets a certain size. That, that might not be so bad. But this provides a very dis very brief way to get, very, you know, it's recommended by clarity and brevity to get 20, 20 values sampled without replacement from the integers. However many it needs, it will do. If, if I were to take 100 distinct values here, what would I get? Yeah, it would be a random permutation. Right, be a random permutation of of zero to ninety of of zero to ninety nine inclusive. Yeah. Um, okay. So fun with streams. Fun with streams. Um, uh, okay. Um, let's further, um, ladies and gentlemen, go and um, look at a uh, a few other elements here. Of, of Scala's non non strictness, okay. Um, okay. Uh, so one thing I would like to look at is is actually the use of uh, call by name and and call by call by value, okay. Um, uh, and, and distinguishing them. Okay. So I'd like to put in place. Um, uh, a mechanism here to examine this issue of, of call by name with greater clarity. So I'm going to define, and, and that's whole use in, in extending a language, I'm going to define um, in, a, in, in our own little mechanisms here, um, mechanisms to capture if-else functionality, okay? So we're going to have a, a, a consequent, which is going to be a predicate, it's going to be true or false. And based on that, we'll, do, we'll use one value or we'll use another value. It'll be an if-else expression. Okay. Um, we'll return one value if it's true. Otherwise, we'll return the other, other value. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to define um, def my if-else um, and it'll take a predicate boolean, I'll take a consequent, and it'll take an, alter uh, an al alternate value, and, and it's going to return an int. And I'm going to say if predicate, then we'll return consequent. Uh, else we'll return the alternate. Okay, here we go. Um, that's going to be the definition of the function. Okay. Um, so uh, am I, yeah, I don't need that. Okay. Okay, so this is obviously a little toy example, but we are sort of extending the language um, uh, in this way trying to implement on our own sort of an, an if-else thing. Now, what's the problem with this construct? I could say my elf feel self strict, and I can say, you know, um, here, uh, true, and I can have uh, one or two. What will this return? What will it return? Or return one. How if I say false? Oh, you don't see it yet. No. Oh man. Okay. Okay. Tell me when you see it. You can see it now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for letting letting me know. Okay. So this seems to work. 
Is this as powerful as the if else construct built into Scala? Right, as it is now? No, why? What's the problem here? Yeah, yeah. So if I were to say, okay, you still can't see it. Um, if I were to say this certain thing, which where the second argument has an error, even if I say essentially only evaluate the first argument, it's going to be a divide by zero. Do you see that? Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? So it's an error condition with a strict thing. If you pass it a computation which exhibits an error, it's strict. It's obliged to, to, to evaluate that. And it does here, right? That's a problem. Do you see that? Um, and in general, if else, you know, it's quite common, we'll use it to to gate the control flow. Which thing do we want to do? We we only want to evaluate one, not the other. And this is forcing us to evaluate both. So this construct, my if else strict, it is it's impoverished. It's it's a pale cipher compared to the strength of of something like the built-in construct, because the built-in construct is not strict. We could say if, you know, in, in Scala, we could say if, you know, this thing is true, two else two divided by zero, and it's gonna be perfectly happy. You can't see it yet, but believe me, it'll be happy. A happy thing will show be showing soon, okay? Um, and it's not my smiling face. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, so let's let's advance beyond this. Did did you see this thing? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, at least there's some suspense in the room. Um, okay. So now I'd like to put in place my if else, and we're going to put in place a my if else that uses explicit closures, ladies and gentlemen. Here, this is the old way of doing it in languages that are functional, but not. But but don't support laziness. An example is Scheme. I don't know if you folks are familiar with Scheme. Um, yeah. Um, oh, that my hat is off to you. That's great. Yeah. Is that right? Okay, that's what we do at MIT too, and and I never regretted it. Um, uh, so so Scheme provides a way. Scheme is a, in general a strict language, but it provides a way for um, you to easily evaluate, uh, create closures, create these these sort of anonymous functions. And if you have my if else, uh, and, and I'll say uh, with closures, um, here, instead of just passing, a, we'll, we'll take a predicate, it's a Boolean, but instead of passing an int, we will pass instead, I'm oh, sorry, well, uh, instead of passing an int for the consequent and alternate, we will pass instead a closure. What would that closure take as an argument? It'll not need to take anything. Ponder this, ladies and gentlemen, once you see it. Ponder it before you see it, too. And that's always a good thing. Okay? Um, so, so we're going to take in something here which is going to be a map from nothing to end. Has it appeared yet? Okay. So my if else with closures. How is this going to be defined? Can anyone tell me? How is it going to be defined? What am I going to, it's going to return an end. And what in will it return? Anyone tell me? I'll start typing it. If pred. If else. Okay. Good. Good. So I can't just say consequent. Why can't I just say consequent without the parentheses? If I. Function? Yes, yeah, a function. So I have to call it, right? Um, else alternate. Oops. 
Um, mumble. Um, okay, so what did I not do? Okay. Um, uh, if if this, then that. Okay. Uh, uh, mumble. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm missing I some. I forgot that. Oh, I forgot the deaf? Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, too bad I can't like use the two seconds or five seconds to go correct it. So like, ignore the last five seconds. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, like hold the presses. If we have the screen, you can do that. <laughs> hold the presses, pause it, okay. Uh, flush the cache, okay. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, do you see what I'm doing here? Now what I'm doing is I'm actually not passing a number in as the consequent or alternate. What am I passing in? I'm passing in a, yeah, I'm passing in a promise for how to compute a number, right? So watch this. Instead of calling with my else if strict, I, I called it with like true one comma two divided by zero. Here, what could I call it with that would that would be comparable to that? Call it with true, but would I just pass it one as the consequent? I would pass it a speak the word that that lifts my heart. A closure, ladies and gentlemen. A closure. Closure, as I tell you. Okay. So this is what I pass in. I don't pass in a number. I, I pass in a function that says, if you need to be computed, this is how you do it. Does it need anything to do its job? No, so it takes nothing as an argument. And then it does its job. It returns, in this case, values, right? But who knows? I mean, it could call a function, whatever. The point is it isn't evaluated unless it needs to be. Do you see that? Because it's a closure. Hmm? And here it works great. I don't know, but you haven't seen it yet, so you can't celebrate yet. But but it, it works great, ladies and gentlemen. Um, even if I pass it something non-strict, I could pass it something that never never terminates here. I could try to compute the first fib between ten thousand and eleven thousand, and and it would it would be a happy camper. Okay. Do, do you see what I've done? Now I passed it a computation that promises how to, it's a recipe. I passed it a recipe. And it actually doesn't prepare the recipe unless it needs to, right? You got that? Okay. Now, um, that's all good. That, that's, that's great. But it's kind of, it's kind of wordy. And it's kind of, um, yeah, it's verbose. It's, it's, it, um, it, it, it's unnecessarily kind of complex. We have to kind of do this very routine wrapping and unwrapping of things in closures, okay? So the way Scala supports a more general mechanism for this with syntactic sugar is it actually has this call by name construct. So now let's do um, my if else with call by name. Hmm? You see that? No. <laughs> okay. Um, and now we simply do this. It's it's just like what we just did, but it's it. We use syntactic sugar. We 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 don't need to kind of put in all these parentheses and so on. Do you see it now? Okay, um, so here we just don't have to put this, you know, this this explicit uh, closure. It wraps it up in a closure for us, a closure that takes nothing. And we don't have to call the closure explicitly here when we use it. Do you see that? Okay, now, now if I do my if else with call by name, Mm -hmm. um, uh, now I don't have to do this at all. It's we're back to the 
to a very similar thing to what we saw in our first one. Remember our first one strict? But it's much more powerful. What was different about this than our first one? Would this have worked? Well, we can't see what this is. It, it would not have worked with our first one. It would not have worked because it's strict. Because we had an error here, it's going to have an error. If we had something that non-terminated passed in, it's going to not terminate because it's strict. This is not strict because we have call by name. So what it's taking here is a recipe. And it's doing something completely con similar to what we said with my MyFLS with closures, but it's doing it in a way that has greater syntactic finesse, okay? Um, to, to make this point, um, uh, you know, further, f further clear yet, maybe what I'll do is do the following. Um, uh, right. So I'll say, um, well, you know, we'll do a, maybe I'll come back, I'll come back to that point. I want to, I want to complete the thought now. So we did my FLs. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in place a do while construct. Okay. So a do while construct is going to take a condition. which is not just a value, like true. It's going to actually take a, a recipe for how to compute whether or not it's true. And, and then we're going to take um, a, a recipe for what to do if it, as long as it is true. Okay, So we're going to define def do while. And the condition here is not going to just be a predicate that evaluates to some known value, it's going to be a recipe for a predicate because we're going to keep on evaluating it. each time we do the loop. We're going to keep on evaluating it, okay? Cool. So this is going to be a condition going to that this is going to be called by name for a Boolean. In other words, it's going to be a recipe that will give us a Boolean. And then we'll have a body, which will be a recipe that, that actually doesn't have a a um, uh, a sort of return value with, as we say, a return value unit. Okay. Um, and, and I want to, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use this case thing. You folks don't need to do it. If you're doing Zeppelin, there's no need for you to do this, but, but in the sort of crude text interface to which I am, which I'm using here, I'm going to do this. Okay, so do while, and you see, oh no, no, oh man, I, 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 uh, I put a, put a plus in. Okay, um, here we go. Paste. Here we go. Okay, um, here we go. Okay, so what am I going to do here? Um, so do while it's gonna. Sorry. Uh. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. I will give it a oh, pop out of this. And and you mean you have to go like this? Well, you can't see this. Okay. Um, uh, okay, yeah, it looks like you're right. Looks like you're right. Thank you. Um, thanks for catching that. No. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, for do while, this is going to be something that will undertake an action, as indicated by the body, until a certain condition is true, okay? So we'll always execute it at least once. And only then will it check if it's true. So what does the definition of do while have to have? What, what's its first element? It needs to do, what does it always do at least once? Uh, the conditions can be checked at the end of the body. So we're gonna do body. This will be executing the body. Okay. Um, that sounds. I'm glad our police. <laughs> you know, we don't have an audience of more policemen in here. Um, okay. And then we're going. To <laughs> that'll be really bad. Um, 
Let's not give this lecture in the police analytics lab. <laughs> okay. And then we're going to say while the condition is true, we're going to do what? We're going to do, yeah, we're going to loop. We're going to execute the body. Okay. Um, so there we go. You can't see it yet, ladies and gentlemen, but we've seen we've seen the um, uh, the definition here, and it's being beamed out worldwide, including to the far corners of the world, such as this small room. <laughs> so is, has it appeared in front of you yet? Okay. Um, okay. So um, here. The do while is going to always execute the body at least once. And then from then on, it'll execute the body successively, but only if the condition is true, right? So now let's go execute this. We've, we've added a new construct, a new non-strict. Is this strict or non-strict? Non-strict. Because non we could pass in something that, uh, that might not uh, terminate. Um, or that causes an error condition um, and still have it evaluate. Actually, the way this is set up, now they think about the body always executes, right? And the condition always executes. So, well, I'm foiled. Okay. Did you mean to use the well, like the in scala well? But we could do if condition, do well, and then, you know, recall. Oh, that's true. That's, then it's recursive, then it's still recursive. That, that is a neat idea. Um, so we could actually define it without recourse to the Scala while construct. Um, that, that is really interesting. Um, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's execute this example. We'll come back to that, I think. Okay, so let's do a do while. We're going to do do while n is less than 10. Um, and I'm, I'm going to actually... Uh, uh, create a, a variable called uh, n here. n equals one. This would be a, um, a variable. We'll do do while n is less than ten, and uh, if it is, we will um, uh, we will print um, n, and um, we will we'll then increment n by one okay um you folks probably can't see this yet can you okay yeah. um and similarly i'll change it to 100. tell me when you can see my do while use mm -hmm. it exhibits um and i'm actually modifying it so we'll put a, a new line after it okay so, um, uh, okay, and, um, oh, yes, of course. Um, so we'll, we'll set n back to one, and there we go. Okay, um, so I put a new line there. Um, did you see that as well? Okay. okay, that's reached you. Now, with the new line, it prints out nicely. Do you see that? Do you see that? And now let's put... Um, the idea that Dorian put forward. So we will put in place, we'll do paste here. Oop. Eight. Okay. Um, here we go. And oh no, this is the problem pointed out by now. Okay, let me let me pop out of that. Okay. Um, and then we'll do while. And then we'll do if condition if condition is true, then we can simply do do while, right? Do while condition uh, and uh, and uh, body. Okay, um, and and body, yeah. Okay, and there we go. And now uh, this is a self-contained sort of do while that's recursively defined. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of reset the value of n to be 1. 
and and execute my do while construct. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So here we've extended the language with a construct that doesn't exist in Scala, that's non-strict. It's a construct that can exist um, uh, in a way comparable to sorry if else. Um, it's very flexible in use, and we've defined it actually recursively, um, uh, not using a while construct. Thanks to Dorian's good suggestion. Okay. Okay, um, so that was a little bit for um, for elements of the language. Okay, now what I'd like to do is is introduce a um, couple more uh, things. So, so in lazy context, we distinguish between call by name, which is it turns out is used each. It's recomputed each time it's used. On the one hand with call by need, which is computed once a single time, and then it's memoized, it's cached, it's it's sort of, uh, the value is retained. Um, call by name, we, we know it's evaluated separately each time, for, uh, for example, for this last example with do while. Why do I say that it was uh, evaluated um, on an each time basis here? How do we know that? based on how the do while worked. Well, clearly it evaluated the body each time successively. Otherwise it would never have gotten up to the value 10, right? Would have computed it once and 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 that would have been it. Let's go um, uh, let's go by contrast look at lazy value. So I'm going to create a lazy value. And this lazy value is going to not be computed unless it's needed, just like any value, any lazy, any lazy value, any lazy value, whether it's called by name or with this lazy value, it's, it's only going to be computed when needed. The question is, once it's computed once, does it remember the results and just save it and use that every time it's, it's needed again, or does it recompute it? So I'm gonna create a lazy val, and I'm going to do this in a way that will um, that will uh, sort of print out when it's evaluated. Okay, here we are. Lazy val a equals, and I create actually a little little block here which uh, prints out something and gives back a value. Do you see that? Okay, so that's my lazy value. Um, And if I use this, if I say A, what do you think will happen? If I say A, what will happen? Yeah, it'll say almost by and it will give a value. Now, if I say A again, what do you think will happen? Well, it turns out it will use the value. If I say A plus A, what do you think will happen? It'll give me the sum of the two, but it's continuing to reuse the value. How do we know it only computed it once? Here, it only printed out one time, ladies and gentlemen. It only printed out one time, okay? Um, this is quite in contrast, to, to, to bring this point home again, if we create um, uh, a function that, um, that uses call by name, for example. Um, uh, you know, we uh, each time we use it, it will recompute it. It'll recompute it. Okay. So this is call by need. That's call by name. Okay. Um, streams adhere more to the call by need construct. They're not only evaluated until you need it. But once you once you compute it, it's cat it's memoized, it's remembered. Remember that? And so that's why it remembers those, it's not going to recompute it. Importantly, that means it uses the memory to um, to, to remember these earlier values, right? Um okay. Um so we've seen call by name. Um here's uh call by need. Um uh, for in the form of, of lazy functions, we've seen streams, uh, etc. 
Um, lots of other uh, components that we could explore here. Um, uh, we only have a few minutes left, uh, but maybe I'll just note a few useful things during this time. One thing is that um, with streams, uh, we can uh, make use of some additional elements um, for uh, in terms of initialization. So we saw this, conti this continually element before. Do you remember that? We could say continually and pass a call by name thing. Remember that? Continually next double. And we could get uh, values there. Alternatively, what we could do is we could say stream, for example, dot from and say from two. And this will give us ascending integers from two. Okay, so we could say, for example, take the first 10 and four. So this actually provides an easier way of giving um, integers. We saw before that we could say stream dot iterate. Remember that? And here we could say like iterate from two. And we could pass in a function that uh, takes in an existing value, okay, long, say, and it returns the square of that value. What is this going to give us for iteration? What is it going to give you there? Anyone? What are, what are, yeah, 2416, 256. What are, how are these related to each other? Each is the what? Is the square of the previous one. So here it's applying this to the uh, to previous one. Um, by contrast, uh, there's uh, another one, and its uh, value is, it, it's its name is actually not on the top of my head uh, right now, but um, it's uh, it's not iterate. Um, oh, there's also yes, empty. It's I think it's tabulate here. Yeah, um, tabulate, where we pass in a value, and then we pass in a function whose job is to take in an index, as I recall. And and then create and I'll do it like this uh, and create um, a square of that uh, that index. So here this is going to be quite different. Here, oops, um, tabulate. Oh, this is the size of the tabulation. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, I misremembered that. Um, it's uh, iterate. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll take the yeah the first uh, uh, the first um, uh, uh, say twenty. Uh, here we go, and so this produces a stream, each of whose elements is it corresponds to the square of the index of that element. Okay, so here are the first twenty. There we go. Each of these numbers is just the square of its index. So this is index zero, one, two, three, et cetera. Okay. Um, there's a, you can also create an, an empty stream, um, and I believe maybe it's a stream in, in a in a range. Although I I'd have to check on that. Um, okay. Um, so that was enough uh, with with streams. So we've seen non-strictness in several forms. Sir, we've seen it with streams. We've seen it with um, call by name. We've seen it with lazy values, okay? Um, and at some point we may see it uh, further with uh, uh, one other mechanism that Scala has for, for sort of creating um, lazy versions uh, associated with data structures.
Okay. Um, I think that's all for today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for bearing with the limitations of technology. Hopefully the uh, tech staff or the, the external uh, university tech folks will be coming and replacing the, the uh, board in this uh, projector. Thanks very much. Thank you.